Good afternoon and welcome to Class WIOA Game Plan for Low Income People webinar series. Today's session will be about developing pathways out of poverty through transitional jobs, expanding opportunities to help low income workers overcome employment barriers with WIOA. This session is co-sponsored by the National Transitional Jobs Network and the Heartland Alliance. I'm Keisha Bird, Director of Youth Policy at CLASS. CLASS seeks to improve the lives of low-income people. We develop and advocate for federal, state, and local policies to strengthen families and create pathways to education and work. I am joined today by three distinguished speakers. Jamie Fountain is the Associate Director of Programs at Larkin Street Youth Services. Jamie has overseen the Workforce Development Program at Larkin Street um, youth services and assist young people and acquire the skills and experience needed to obtain above minimum wage employment through job readiness classes, internships, employment sector training, and employment counseling. I'm also joined by Melissa Young, who is the director of Heartland Alliance's National Initiative on Poverty and Economic Opportunity. She advances national initiatives dedicated to ensuring that every person can succeed in work and support themselves and their families, including the National Transitional Jobs Network, the National Center on Employment and Homelessness, and the Black Men Overcoming Barriers and Realizing Employment Initiative. Chris Warlin is the Associate Director for Field Building at Heartland Alliance's National Initiative on Poverty and Economic Opportunity. His work also includes those initiatives, and he supports employment services for chronically unemployed individuals across the country by overseeing the development of best practice guides, white papers, and other resources that facilitate peer learning and designing delivery, trainings, and consulting with employment initiatives at the state, local, and national levels. So today, we will provide you with a WIOA overview, Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act overview, what is in the law and what you need to know. We will turn it over to the Transitional Jobs Network, who will discuss effective transitional job strategies, opportunities to advance transitional jobs through WIOA. And we will hear from Larkin Street Youth Services about their workforce development programming on the ground. Throughout today's session, please use the chat function to ask any questions you may have of the speakers, and class will respond to as many questions as we can, as well as the speakers, as well as are committed to um, answering the most frequently asked questions following the webinar session. So what is in the law and what do you need to know? So the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act passed last summer with wide bipartisan majority in Congress. It's the first reauthorization of the National Workforce Program in 16 years. It emphasizes newer and proven strategies in workforce development. The scope of WIOA six core program includes Title I adult dislocated worker and youth funding streams. Title II, which is adult education and family literacy funding stream. Title III, employment service, Wagner Pizer. And Title IV, which is vocational rehabilitation. It emphasizes partnerships, service delivery partners with TANF and Second Chance Act, and other potential partners such as CTE, Career and Technical Education, and SNAP, Employment and Training. So we feel there are new opportunities to better serve low-income and low-skilled adults and youth. WIOA offers four opportunities that increases the focus on serving the most vulnerable workers. It expands proven education and training options. It helps disadvantaged and unemployed adults and youth earn while they learn. And it aligns planning and accountability policies across the core programs. How does WIOA target funds to helping those with barriers to economic success? Well, first, 
75% of youth funds are required to be spent on out-of-school youth. The statute strengthens priority of service for public assistance recipients and individuals who are low income and have barriers to employment. It includes an interim progress measure skills gain to reward programs helping the hardest to serve. It also includes a number of new definitions that make it easier for local areas to serve individuals with barriers to employment. It expands education and training options, encourages career pathways throughout the statute, clarifies that WIOA training funds can be used for individuals who are unable to obtain Pell Grants. There's a broader focus of adult education on transition to the labor market, and it encourages integrated education and training models. Enabling people to earn while they learn. I'll highlight a few of these levers. The on-the-job training wage reimbursement is now 75%. It includes up to 10% of funds available for transitional jobs for individuals with barriers to employment. That is, local areas can designate up to 10% of their Title I funds. And we'll learn a lot more about that throughout today's session. In particular, paid work experience for youth, including summer jobs, are required, 20% of youth formula funds are required to be spent on these um, activities for in-school and out-of-school youth. I'll highlight a few areas of how WIOA aligns planning and accountability policies. Um, WIOA no longer requires a youth council, but however, the local board may have a youth subcommittee. It does require a unified state plan of all core programs, and states are allowed to combine one or more additional programs to incentivize alignment and planning. State and local plans must include youth and adults with barriers in their analysis, needs, vision, and goals. And there are common measures across multiple programs with slight variation for the Title I youth program. And now I would like to turn it over to Melissa, who's going to talk more about transitional job strategies and how they help workers with barriers to economic success get on a pathway to employment. My name is Melissa Young, and I'm the director of Heartland Alliance's National Initiatives on Poverty and Economic Opportunity. Um, thank you all so much for joining the webinar today. Before we dive into the substance um, of um, WIOA and the new opportunities to serve um, low-income adults and youth, I want to provide just a little bit of an overview of the national initiatives on poverty and economic opportunity um, here at Heartland Alliance. Um, Heartland Alliance's national initiatives on poverty and economic opportunity um, focus on um, and are dedicated to ending chronic unemployment and poverty. Um, we do this through a myriad of ways, um, but we primarily work at the intersection of practice and policy and research um, to catalyze change in local communities and states and at the federal level um, that is practical and informed by research evidence and grounded in the experience of providers across the country and the individuals and families that they serve. Our field building work um, provides support and guidance um, to local communities and to states, as well as to pro program providers, um, to foster more effective and sustainable employment efforts. Um, our policy and advocacy work at the federal level and at the state level advances solutions to the systemic issues um, that drive chronic unemployment and poverty in communities. The National Transitional Jobs Network, which is one of our national initiatives under the National Initiatives on Poverty and Economic Opportunity, um, is a national coalition dedicated to getting chronically unemployed Americans back to work. Our focus is on trans advancing transitional jobs programs to help individuals and families with barriers to employment to succeed in the workforce. Um, our work opens doors to work through a myriad of different ways, um, technical assistance to providers, to states and communities, research and evaluation, education and training, um, and policy and advocacy work. 
So with that, um, let's begin to talk a little bit about um, WIOA and the new opportunities that exist within WIOA to serve adults and youth um, that face barriers to employment. As many of us know, um, WIA created, created and had constraints around serving many individuals and youth with barriers to employment. Um, many individuals and youth had trouble accessing appropriate services through WIA, and the new law under WIOA addresses many of these constraints constraints um, that we've heard time and time again from community-based providers, um, from states, from workforce leaders, experts, and researchers. In particular, the new law um, creates an intentionality around serving individuals with barriers to employment. Um, there's a robust definition of what an individual with barriers to employment um, means within the workforce law, and that it, um, and that definition includes um, low-income, out-of-school youth um, that are facing a myriad of um, barriers to employment in their state and local community. Um, this definition also includes individuals uh, with a criminal record um, and homeless individuals, among many others. We will also amend the performance um, measures um, to take into consideration um, the characteristics of job seekers being served, which is really important when we think about um, serving individuals with barriers to employment who may not um, be successful in accessing employment or staying employed um, as quickly as other job seekers who are more work ready. The, the new law also um, prioritizes a range of um, earn and learn strategies, employment strategies that combine um, training and education to help support people in earning income as well as gaining necessary skills to traverse in the labor market. Finally, the new law creates some opportunities within planning processes um, to really ensure that local and state workforce systems are taking into consideration uh, the workforce needs of people with barriers to employment. Um, so state and local plans need to articulate how they will increase employment, education, training, and support services for individuals with barriers to employment. Most notably for this webinar in particular, um, the new WIOA law allows for uh, transitional jobs programs, which is a form of subsidized employment and one uh, kind of earn and learn strategy to be implemented within the new law. Um, Transitional jobs programs within WIOA um, is, is defined as time-limited work experiences that are subsidized in a public, private, or nonprofit sector for individuals with barriers to employment who are chronically unemployed or who have an inconsistent work history. These transitional jobs programs are combined with um, comprehensive employment and support services and are designed to assist individual, individuals in establishing a work history, demonstrating success in the workplace, and developing skills to entry into employment and retention into unsubsidized employment. As defined in the new WIOA law, transitional jobs um, programs can be implemented in local communities utilizing WIOA funds. Lo the local board may use not more than 10% of the funds allocated to the local area for transitional jobs programs. And so from, that, from here on, we're going to talk a little bit more about how transitional jobs programs operate in communities and how they can be leveraged to help support adults and youth with barriers to employment. And so to get into the details of that, I'm going to turn um, the webinar over to my colleague, Chris Borland. Okay, thanks very much. Um, my name is Chris Warland. I'll tell you a little bit about uh, transitional jobs under WIOA and uh, some ideas for implementing TJ under the new law, as well as some uh, rationale for why workforce boards should consider uh, dedicating resources to transitional jobs programming. First of all, I'll tell you a little bit about the goals of the transitional jobs strategy. Um, of course, the, the primary goal of TJ is to help people to successfully transition to unsubsidized employment. However, there are a number of additional goals uh, of the transitional jobs strategy uh, that are important as well. Um, first of all, TJ aims to 
stabilize individuals and families with much needed earned income. Uh, low income individuals and families need earned income in order to meet their basic needs. And the transitional job strategy is designed to get people working and earning money as rapidly as possible. Um, so that they can be stabilized and meet their basic needs and be able to um, receive additional services as well. Um, in addition, uh, TJ is designed to be an experiential learning opportunity in which job seekers that don't have a lot of experience in the workplace can learn successful workplace behaviors by actually working. And it's an environment in which um, an individual can uh, develop, practice, and model those successful workplace behaviors. Um, TJ is also designed to come with a set of supportive services to address and mitigate barriers to work. And those services can include um, whatever the individual needs in order to become successful in the workplace. So that could include uh, assistance with transportation, assistance with childcare, assistance with uh, financial management, anger management, um, and really any kind of employment-focused supportive services that the individual needs. Uh, TJ also helps people build a work history and get a recent reference onto their job applications and resumes. Uh, we have an environment in the labor market now where people who have been chronically unemployed, unemployed for a long time, are still suffering a disadvantage in the competitive labor market. And TJ provides a recent work history and a recent reference to help uh, address that barrier. Um, also, it's important to note that uh, one of the largest and most important anti-poverty programs at the federal level is the Earned Income Tax Credit, but individuals need to earn wages in order to be eligible for that. And so earning wages through the transitional jobs model allows uh, low-income people to access the EITC. Um, and then finally, uh, TJ is about building skills uh, to help transition to unsubsidized employment when the subsidized employment period ends. So here are some of the core components of the TJ model. Um, most of these uh, components will be familiar to people who uh, are working in the workforce development field. Um, what sets the TJ model apart is the transitional job itself. And so uh, the core components include orientation and assessment. That includes assessment for skills assessment to identify and address barriers, as well as assessments around uh, career interests and aptitudes to help match uh, an individual with an employment opportunity that, uh, that suits their uh, interests and needs. Um, also, job readiness uh, coursework is often involved to help individuals develop soft skills that they'll later on practice in the transitional job itself. Um, as I mentioned, connections to a range of support services, depending on what that individual needs in order to be successful in the workplace. The transitional job itself, which is a real wage paid work experience. That means that um, transitional workers are working in real jobs, they're working for real wages, um, and uh, they're gaining that real work experience for a limited period of time, uh, combined with job development, job placement support, and retention support so that by the time the subsidy period ends, that individual is transitioning into unsubsidized employment and they're receiving the necessary retention supports to remain successful in unsubsidized employment. And then finally, linkages to education and training. We understand that um, entry-level work often does not pay enough to sustain an individual or a family uh, and to meet their basic needs. And we recognize that further education and training is often necessary to help people advance beyond entry-level work to earn uh, sustaining wages, to access benefits, and to access uh, advancement opportunities in the labor market. Um, and so sector-based training, occupational training, and post-secondary education uh, are all pathways toward uh, advancement in the workplace. All right, so uh, workforce development professionals who are working in the public funded system, uh, in the WIA system, um, often uh, 
want to know what differentiates the TJ strategy from on-the-job training. So how is TJ different from OJT? Uh, there are a few basic ways in which it's different. Um, one is that the wage subsidy in OJT is typically for a portion of the individual's wages. Um, and under the TJ strategy, uh, wages are reimbursed typically 100%. Um, also, there's a difference in who acts as employer of record. Under OJT, the employer is often asked to make a hiring decision up front and then to receive a reimbursement for a portion of that individual's wages once they've been hired. Under TJ, often the, the program acts as employer of record. Uh, the employer is not uh, asked to make a hiring decision immediately, but has the opportunity to try that individual out. It's kind of like an audition. And then once the individual proves themselves, they, they uh, have demonstrated themselves to be a valuable worker and a good fit for the job, then the hope is that the employer will take that person onto their payroll and they will become a permanent employee. But initially, uh, under most circumstances, the TJ program acts as employer of record to begin with. Um, there's also a difference in the target population. Um, the transitional job strategy is designed for people with more barriers to employment, uh, typically people who would not be working without the intervention. Um, and so it's important to, uh, to remember that uh, if you're going to make an investment in transitional jobs, uh, that targeting is really key. And I'll talk about that in a little bit as well. Um, and then finally, TJ often comes packaged with more and more intensive supportive services than on-the-job training. So some of the supportive services that I mentioned before um, are often not a part of OJT, but they are typically a part of TJ. Um, it's also uh, worth noting that um, under the new law, under WIWA, there are uh, pretty substantial changes to the way uh, workforce boards are investing in youth and youth employment. Um, TJ is already used very broadly across the country to help uh, youth who are not working or in school to uh, connect to earned income, to connect to the workforce, um, and to access education and training. Um, oftentimes, young people who are not working or in school uh, are not actively engaging or seeking out services of any kind. Um, and the promise of a real job and real wages can act as an incentive to engage those youth who might not otherwise be seeking services, um, and then to provide those additional services to them while they're working. Um, it's also particularly useful uh, in many cases uh, to provide subsidized employment for young people who have absolutely no prior work experience whatsoever, who need that first work opportunity to help them to uh, break into the labor market um, and to practice some of those skills. Um, and then finally, uh, as we move toward uh, the new rules under WIOA, which require workforce boards to invest 75 percent uh, of their funding into serving out-of-school youth, the TJ model really provides some lessons for how uh, workforce boards can take that summer youth employment model and transition to uh, a year-round subsidized employment model that serves out-of-school youth. So some of the best practices and promising practices and principles for providing TJ uh, to young people facing barriers to employment. Um, these are some of the promising practices that we've identified from extensive interviews with providers over the course of the last year or so. Um, often we hear about meeting youth where they are by uh, acknowledging where that individual is um, in their own uh, personal stages of change, if you will, um, and to address them and their needs at that point and help them move forward from where they are. Um, it's a, about accepting where a young person is with regard to ambivalence about work, readiness to engage in employment services, etc. Uh, we also see programs that are engaging youth for extended periods of time, whereas a typical adult employment program, uh, even programs designed for adults with barriers to employment, uh, might only uh, engage for three to nine months. Uh, a lot of programs that are serving youth and serving them well are engaging them over the course of years. 
Um, it takes that long often to build a trusting, caring adult relationship. Um, if youth have experienced trauma, if they've experienced homelessness, if they're justice involved, um, if they're aging out of foster care, if they've experienced extreme poverty, uh, a lot of times they're in survival mode and it takes a while to, to develop a trusting relationship with a caring adult. Um, programs often also have uh, stepped TJ programs that uh, help young people to engage in relatively low stress work experiences to begin with, with relatively low expectations, and then to move them through graduated levels of increasing stress and responsibility to the point where they're ready to take on an unsubsidized job. Um, they often also offer multiple chances for those young people to fail and to re-enter programming. So that might mean uh, getting kicked out of a program, it might mean getting fired from an employment opportunity, but nevertheless having a structured pathway and process for them to re-enter programming and to re-enter employment as many times as it takes uh, to ultimately become successful. And then uh, also um, the same as with transitional jobs programs for adults, we recognize that it's absolutely essential uh, for young job seekers to access further education and training so that they can enter high quality jobs and not uh, get stuck in um, low skilled entry level work. So why should workforce boards make this investment? We know that when you're subsidizing wages, um, that is by def definition a, a somewhat cost intensive strategy. And we know that uh, along with all of the good changes in WIOA, there's not additional funding to provide some of these more uh, in intensive services. And so it's really important to, uh, to understand the rationale for why um, since transitional jobs is now an allowable use of funds under WIOA, we should uh, actually make the decision to invest in the strategy. Um, and there are a few good reasons that we've identified. One is that the, the good candidates for transitional jobs, those that are facing the most barriers, those that would really have a hard time succeeding in work without this kind of information or uh, intervention, are already walking through your doors. They're already seeking services. And if they're not well served by the scope of services that you have available, it's really essential that you have um, an evidence-based strategy in your toolkit to help address their needs. Um, that becomes even more important since there is an increased emphasis under WIOA um, on planning and identifying better ways to improve services and access to services for people with barriers. And um, if you have some evidence-based strategies that you're able to implement, um, then that's going to make your plans to better serve these individuals much more meaningful and effective. Um, and then finally, just kind of a value that we believe um, that uh, a public system should serve everyone who's eligible to receive services, and it should serve them well. And so for individuals who are facing the most barriers to employment, if they're able to access uh, interventions like transitional jobs through the public system, then uh, those should be available to them as eligible users of those public services. Um, so if, uh, if we understand why it should be done, we also need to know how it can be done and how it can be done in an environment with some pretty significant constraints on resources. Um, First of all, it's really important to make sure that transitional jobs target the right people. If somebody uh, could be successful in accessing employment without the transitional job strategy, then they should not receive it. It should not be for anybody who could be successful in their job search otherwise. It should be targeted at people with the most barriers who would not otherwise be successful. And uh, we also have a lot of research evidence that suggests that the transitional job strategy is most effective for those who face the most barriers. So it really makes sense to have a highly targeted transitional jobs program that's only available to the people who need it the most. Um, in many cases, uh, there are community-based organizations that are already implementing transitional jobs programs for people with barriers to employment and already have specialized knowledge and capacity for delivering it. And so many workforce boards, WIBs, One Stops, actually contract with those community-based organizations to deliver the transitional jobs services rather than reinventing the wheel in-house. Um, and then finally, uh, 
there are also opportunities to partner with other public systems uh, that also have resources available to support transitional jobs programming, notably TANF, uh, Second Chance Act initiatives, um, SNAP initiatives, and um, workforce boards should really have a look at all of the other public partners that they can work with in order to support and provide comprehensive transitional job services to those who need them. Okay, thanks very much, and I think we're going to turn it over to Jamie now from Larkin Street. Thank you, Chris. And as Chris stated earlier, please, if you have any questions you'd like to send, please don't hesitate to use the chat box, and we'll get them as soon as possible. Um, Larkin Street Youth Services is a program that's been around since 1984, and we work with chronically homeless youth. And we work with ages from 12 to 24. Uh, the mission of Larkin Street is um, to create a continuum of services that inspires youth to move beyond the street. We will nurture potential, promote dignity, and support bold steps by all. So what, how we do that is through a continuum of care. When a young person is thinking about coming off the street, they're usually just thinking about getting out of the elements. So we have a shelter system where uh, Larkin Street runs a youth shelter that they can be in for four months. And as Chris uh, referenced earlier, that orientation and assessment period is extremely important in preparing a young person to succeed in employment. The first part when you work with a young person may or may not have anything to do with employment. is to find out what their needs are. So as you see from this diagram coming in point of entry, we first look at health services. Do they have mental health issues? Do they have other issues that have, that have created barriers for them to going to work? Dealing with those issues and developing tools to address those issues are the primary part and the most important baseline to start working with these young people. The second is housing. If they don't have stable housing, there's no way they're going to be able to gain the skills and practice those skills in a supportive work environment when they're worried about where they're going to sleep at night or where they're going to get their food or where they're going to get the clothing that they need. Second is an education and employment combination. Larkin Street Youth Services is a program services agency that provides housing not a housing agency that provides services. So for a young person to be allowed to come into a transitional living program, they have to agree to participate in both education and employment programming, not one or the other. So again, meeting their basic needs, and we use that by going through what's called the stages of change. And the stages are pre-contemplation, meaning they're really not thinking about employment or education, they're just trying to get out of the elements. Contemplation, having conversations to help them think about what their next steps would be, where they would like to be, and how to get there. Action, usually that's when they're engaging in an education or employment training program. And then maintenance, once they've gone through the training program and they've been able to master the soft skills to perform at a work site and go through the transitional program, then they have the maintenance of trying to get through the 90 days. How do you continue to develop how do you get your first raise? How do you continue developing your skills? And then supporting the young person into independent living so they can have their own apartment and start growing as, as, as a functioning normal adult. Next slide, please. How we do that is we have many different paid experiences, our transitional program experiences. Our engagement one is called Youth Force. This particular program offers immediate paid work for homeless youth. It's a cross-program collaboration. So what Youth Force does is it supports Larkin Street's housing programs by doing graffiti abatement, litter removal, and other landscaping um, opportunities within our own programs. We also partner with 47 other agencies and um, private industries to do everything from landscaping for them, um, painting a garage, other, if you will, manual labor opportunities to get that first experience, that test run, to see how they enact in uh, a work environment. Can they follow instruction? Can they get along with others? What, what are the triggers that trigger young people? A lot of times you'll talk to a young person and they'll react in a way that's kind of confusing for someone. That reaction may be because the person they're talking to uh, reminds them of the person who either caused them trauma or caused them to have a difficult situation or may have made them to become homeless. So they're reacting to a situation in a way that goes into the survival mode. So what Larkin does is before we place a young person, we work with the staff of the place that we're um, placing the young person to understand these situations and give them tools and methodologies that they can use to help one with the other person. We also continue case managing young person through all of their placements. And some of the things that they can get in youth force is one uniforms, wages. We pay 11.07 an hour. 
so they get above minimum wage during this process. Realistic consequences, if a young person is late for work, we'll send them back home. Experience for resumes, so now they can be in youth force for up to three months, and then they can actually matriculate in a more structured youth work crew to work for six months, or go into one of our um, educational experiences and job training programs, which I'll highlight later. Projects, like I said, that, that they do are trash pickups, graffiti cleanup, pressure washing. We do a lot of PR with other nonprofits. We'll present at um, different job fairs and what we do. And we also work with the San Francisco Poor Project in helping landscape them during the summer as well for our underage young people. Next. Next slide, please. So the job readiness class, or what we now call the employment training program, goes from Monday to Friday. And to step back a little bit, all of our training programs pay a stipend or a wage. So they're learning and they're earning, getting that dynamic going. And the more skills they get, the next training program, they get paid more. So as they develop a skill set and add more to that skill set, they, the, the increase of the stipend happens. So through the job readiness course, it's five weeks, not four. We've tweaked it up a little bit since I did the slides. Excuse me. Apologize about that. Um, so we've, we've uh, tweaked it up a little bit to include more. OK. They get to be in class. We also have people come in from different industries, the tech industry, the hospitality industry, and talk about how they, excuse me. Sorry about that. Talk about hey, they, how they got their jobs, what was their path, what they studied in school, and so forth. And it really does inflame the imagination of the young people. The curriculum also covers employment skills they're going to need in a wide variety of different industries, such as customer service, critical thinking, and so forth. Next slide. Then we have the opportunity for an internship or a higher, it's called the Institute for Higher Learning. This particular program is a concentrated six-month internship. We have 47 internship sites, both for-profit and not-for-profit places. Uh, they get to work 20 hours a week, so they can also continue their education and any therapy or other things that they need to participate in. It helps subsidize their vocational certificate programs. Say they want to go, uh, their dream is to be a hairstylist. We can actually pay for them to go to cosmetology school using the internship programs. Huge range of opportunities. We have internships at Recology. We have internships at Google. We have internships at a myriad of different industries so that young people can follow their passions. And then we have a lot of collaborative partners. We work with everyone, as I stated before, from Google to uh, Morpho Detection, who um, manufactures the uh, x-ray technicians for airports. We work with San Francisco International Airport and host internships, as well as many other partners throughout the Bay Area. Next slide, please. And then we also have internal internships. Of course, a lot of our young people come through Larkin Street and say, I want to help young people now. I want to be part of the solution. So I have 17 internships with the different programs that we have here at Larkin Street. So they can see how the dynamics of nonprofit work works, what it's like to, to help a young person get through something. We also have uh, internships at some of the other nonprofits in the city, such as Goodwill and United Way and Chalk. And also, we allow the youth to help design and run the program planning. We have what's called a youth advisory board that um, has a young person from each of our housing programs. They talk to the youth in their housing programs, and they bring information back to us, which helps us design youth-friendly and youth-driven programming. Next slide, please. Building strong collaborations. What we, do, what we find is one of the most important things is training employers on how to work with homeless and at-risk of youth. As I stated earlier, um, the average homeless young person becomes homeless at the, year, at the age of 14. They stop growing maturely. They become somewhat feral. They create relationships and traps within the homeless community. So when they decide to start coming into services, we have to retrain them in the very basics from personal hygiene to communication to how to dress for work to how to change your point of view to match what your environment is, how to adjust to a culture at a new work environment, and so forth. Again, inviting employers to conduct employment workshops within the youth so that the employer is invested in the young people that they're working with. And many times, the speaker who comes and speaks to the, the employment class will have one of that class be their intern. So it's a longer commitment and a longer chance of opportunity of mentoring and coaching this young person on their career port, choice and passion. Having youth perform volunteer hours at employee work sites. That we use when a young person says, I want to be an intern, but I want to do it here. So what I'll say is if you can get that, that industry or that business or whomever to let you intern there for volunteer hours, we can maybe set up a six-month structured internship site. And that gets the young person invested in looking for an internship site, which mirrors or mocks looking for a job. Next. 
Next slide, please. Tying employment and education program together is extremely, extremely, extremely important. We've now launched what we call the Larkin Street Academy, where our young people can be in what we call bridge programs for five to six months, 30 hours a week, mimicking a real job. They receive a wage for being there, and they're learning the, the tennis of that industry. Right now, we're supporting a retail success training program, because retail is a large sector here in San Francisco, and also, also hospitality. Hospitality is a very large sector growth in San Francisco, so we have a very comprehensive hospitality training program, and we get support from the Omni Hotel, the Marriott Hotel, and other hotels who send their managers and HR departments over to the training program and actually do real-time training with the young people about what it's like to work in real-time hotels, what the expectations are, and what the skills are needed for that. We include education groups in every job readiness training. So if a young person does not have a GED or high school diploma, they also have to do GED tutoring and agree to take the GED test before they can participate in the job training program. And also in all of those groups, if they do have a GED or high school diploma, they're required to conduct college readiness courses with two of our college support staff who help them understand how to get into um, grants, how to find the right school for you, what are the right classes to match the dream that you have with your career track, and so forth. And all of them, both GED and college, have to attend tutoring sessions or college readiness has to be part of the internships. Next slide. What, one of the methodologies that we use that has proven to work is harm reduction. And harm reduction simply means, as Chris referred to earlier, meeting a young person where they're at. So whatever their real moment is, that's okay. And that's why many times we'll have a young person stay in the shelter for four months and not try to get a job. Because we need to find out what their frame of mind is, what their challenges are, using that assessment, again, that Chris related earlier, of how to find out the best way to support that young person. Motivational interviewing when conducting assessments. Um, an employment counselor's job should not be getting a young person to job. An employment counselor's job should be developing a relationship that will allow them to be um, a mentor and a coach for the young person and helping the young person get their own job. And motivational area unit is just using open-ended questions and allowing the young person to tell their story instead of you trying to tell the story for them. Working with youth and identifying employment goals. As all of us know, if you enjoy what you do and you never have to work hard a day in your life, so what we do is we talk about young people. What are their passions? What are their talents? What do they enjoy doing? What do they do in their spare time? And then how we could possibly relate that to a career track. And then creating an employment plan for each youth that meets their needs and their skill set, where they're at at that moment, and then gravitationally changing those goals to meet that as they grow and develop more skills into their uh, workforce toolbox. Next slide. Um, that would be all for me for right now. I guess it's now time for open discussion for question and answers. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Chris and Melissa. Thank you for everyone who is on the call. We have a number of questions that have been coming through throughout the session. And I'll turn the uh, first uh, several questions over to Chris and, or Melissa. Um, what is the length of time for participants in transitional jobs? Three months, six months? And under um, TJ, what are some examples of allowable support services? Uh, hi. Um, thanks very much for the questions. Um, <clears throat> as far as the length of time that's optimal for somebody to be in transitional employment, um, we don't have uh, an exact number. Uh, pinned down, but we do understand that um, there is kind of an optimal range of time for somebody to be in transitional employment. We know a little bit more about adults than we do about youth in this regard, and we do believe that with youth, uh, the optimal period of time might be longer. With adults, um, we do recognize that if the transitional job is too short, that that individual won't get the right amount of experience and skill building in order to really be able to translate that into success in the competitive labor market. On the other hand, when the transitional job is too long, uh, not only does it cost more, but uh, the individual might also um, become so comfortable in that job that they come to regard it as their job and they're really reluctant to move on to that next opportunity. Um, so we really think that um, for adults, the range is somewhere 
between uh, six and nine months of transitional employment, depending on the barriers that the individual needs to address and the learning needs that they have in order to, to get through that. Um, with youth, as I said, we, we don't have uh, a range um, that we're, we're aware of as being optimal, but we do think that it's probably, uh, in many cases, a little bit longer than, uh, than it is with adults. Um, Chris, and then, what are some yes. examples of allowable support services? Um, well, you know, the support services that are uh, provided along with transitional jobs are really a broad range of services. What they all have in common is that they're all focused on um, mitigating or eliminating barriers to employment. Um, as far as what will be allowable under WIOA, um, I think that remains to be seen, although, however, we definitely uh, push for, um, you know, a rather broad definition of what those supportive services could look like, and they would include things like transportation, child care, uh, financial management coursework, anger management coursework, um, and uh, really any service that could be connected to greater livelihood for success in the workplace. Great. This is Melissa. Thank you. This is Melissa. Oh, I'll so just go ahead. Before we go yeah, to the next set of questions. Sure, I'll just add um, um, that this is, especially in providing supportive services that help mitigate or eliminate barriers to employment, this is really where um, we think that workforce systems um, can, can really maximize partnering with other systems. Um, certainly we know that other systems have a broad array um, of support services that can be leveraged to support individuals um, who may be eligible and benefit from transitional jobs programs. So this is really, I think, a space in which we hope that local communities would really think thoughtfully about how to partner with other systems to leverage those resources and, and support services. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa and Chris. So this next question um, is about how transitional jobs work to accommodate youth and adults with disabilities. We had several questions come. Um, in um, around individuals with disabilities, what resources and strategies are accessed? And I'm wondering, Jamie, if you can share um, some of the work that you do at Larkin Street, given that your um, your program model is really about um, in the beginning assessing the health and mental health needs. That's a very important part because if we don't address what's causing their um, mental health and, and everything to react, then that's just going to replicate itself in the workplace. So doing that assessment, making sure that every young person, if a young person has been homeless, then they've had some, some trauma. So it needs to be trauma-induced discussions. It needs to have, everyone needs to meet with a therapist to get an assessment done. And then make sure that we're meeting the need for that specific young person and where they're at in that moment. And that need changes as we go forward and they go through the different dynamics. And we found at Larkin Street, to go back to the question about how long a young person should be in transitional employment, we found that a year to 18 months gets the most impact from our, for our demographic. Excellent. Thank you. And Melissa, um, perhaps you want to address this next question. How has the Transitional Jobs Network connected with um, the U.S. Department of Labor um, around the work that is being done via disability employment. So again, another question around connecting um, youth and adults um, uh, to work through a transitional job strategy. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, so those of us at the, at the NTJN have been working with the Department of Labor for many, many years um, in advancing transitional jobs uh, programs. Um, there is a federal demonstration of transitional jobs programs that are serving um, primarily adults um, who are returning from incarceration uh, to communities and non-custodial parents. Um, we have also worked with the Department of Labor um, on a number of sort of um, best and promising practices um, and uh, currently are working with the Department of Labor around um, several initiatives focused on employment and homelessness, um, and particularly in that work um, where we see um, a high proportion of individuals who experience homelessness who um, have a disability, it's where our work has really grown um, with the department, both from an education perspective, but also a partnership perspective, really thinking about 
other federal agencies um, that can be leveraged to support um, not only education with the Department of Labor um, in, in supporting um, best and promising practices, but also thinking about um, really important um, benefits and um, the occurrence of benefit cliffs that may exist um, for individuals with disabilities who may be receiving um, SSI or SSDI. Um, so we are in current conversations with the Department of Labor and continuing to have these kinds of conversations. Um, we're also working very closely with the United States Interagency Council on Homelessness. Um, this is at the center of 19 federal, federal agencies um, within their plan to prevent and end homelessness. Um, and it's through that work as well that we are working with the Department of Labor as well as with other federal agencies and really lifting up um, not only this issue but really thinking about solutions as well. Excellent. Thank you, Melissa. So we have several more questions coming in and um, I'm going to direct this next one to either Chris or Jamie. Can any of the speakers please talk about successful strategies for employer and business engagement? And maybe, Jamie, if you can um, give us one example. You gave us a couple during your remarks. And Chris, since you've been going around the country documenting many of these strategies, if you can give us one or two as well. Um, well, I'll, I'll give you one here in San Francisco. We started developing a relationship with the Gap. And uh, having them, we did what was called a retail boot camp, where the young people could go there and spend one day with Gap employees. And maybe it full close for a minute, they do customer service a minute and so forth. That developed into now seven of our young people are working at the flagship store on Market Street and they felt more supported and part of a family. So it was really great that, they, that GAP was open to supporting that and allowing us to, to have them participate in our training program. Uh, yes, and, and I would add that um, we at the NTJN have just recently published an employer engagement toolkit <clears throat> And that toolkit is available for free on our website. If you go to transitionaljobs.net and click on resources and then toolkits, it will lead you to our employer engagement toolkit. And we've really uh, spent a lot of time looking at um, what are the effective practices for engaging employers? What's the messaging that's effective to employers to encourage them to partner with transitional jobs programs as well as to consider hiring transitional jobs program graduates? Um, and um, it includes a number of uh, resources including um, findings from a number of employer surveys from around the country um, where employers were asked about the value that they saw in partnering with transitional jobs and subsidized employment programs, why they chose to participate, whether or not they would participate again, um, and where they saw value to their business. And so, um, you know, among the other goals of transitional jobs, uh, you know, benefits to individuals and, and families uh, living in poverty, uh, there are also a lot of advantages and benefits to the employers that partner with TJ programs and to local communities in which TJ programs operate. And so I would encourage people to check out our Employer Engagement Toolkit to get some of that information. There are also some other sample documents, sample one-page handouts for employers, as well as a revised version of our Guide to Job Development in the Context of Transitional Jobs. Um, and so uh, there, uh, there's a wealth of uh, good ideas there for um, improving your employer engagement and getting employers on board with your mission and operations and transitional jobs programming. Thank you, Chris. So we just have a little bit of time left, and the next set of questions um, would relate to some specifics about transitional jobs planning. And I just want to reiterate a couple of slides that uh, Melissa mentioned in the beginning of her presentation and that I mentioned as well is that um, transitional jobs is now an allowable um, activity up to 10% of local funds. So it's not mandatory. And so local uh, workforce boards will need to, again, really see the value of transitional job strategy. And as we discussed today on this session, it's very valuable to individuals youth and adults with barriers to employment. Some of the other questions that were asked were about wage subsidies um, and a minimum wage and payment. And so I'll turn it over to you, Chris, um, to see if there's anything that you can add to this question. But again, um, we are waiting on the Department of Labor and Education and Health and Human Services 
to issue their notice of proposed regulations. So some of the specifics will be decided at the federal, state, or local levels about implementation. The last question is, um, are there requirements around paying at least minimum wage versus a sub-minimum wage or stipend? Mm -hmm. um, yes, uh, at the National Transitional Jobs Network, and, and uh, as you said, it remains to be seen what the federal regulations will be on this issue, but um, we really um, are uh, firm believers in paying real wages for real work to transitional jobs workers, and so that includes paying at least the federal or local minimum wage to transitional workers. Um, and uh, the reason for that is that, um, you know, we want to emphasize that, uh, that we value work um, and we want to establish for transitional jobs participants this connection between the work that they're doing and the wage that they're paid and ensuring that they're getting not only compensated for the work that they do, but that they're also receiving every other benefit and protection that they're eligible for as workers. Um, and for this reason, we recommend not only that uh, transitional workers are paid at least the minimum wage that's you know prevailing in their area, uh, but also um, that uh, they are employees of the transitional jobs program and eligible for all of the other uh, protections that they would receive as employees of that organization, rather than um, you know uh, receiving um, something along the lines of a training stipend. A number of transitional jobs programs do uh, structure their programs in terms of a stipend, but our recommended best practice is to pay a wage and that it be at least the minimum wage. Great. Thank you, Chris. So we are um, nearing the end of our session. I want to thank you all for taking time out to learn more about transitional jobs and how it can be an effective strategy through WIOA implementation to serving individuals, youth, and adults with barriers to employment. CLASS and the National Transitional Jobs Network committed to sending out materials to you that we referenced on the session today, as well as and to answering more of the questions that were asked during the session. Feel free to contact all of us for additional information regarding transitional jobs or the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. Once again, thank you for your time and have a wonderful day.